Thank you very much, uh, William, and thank you so much for the invitation to come in here today and, and talk to you guys. Uh, I'd also like to thank my co-authors for their contribution to this uh, paper. Uh, and I'm going to speak today about the hidden foundation of field vision in English Premier League soccer players. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a lot of background for you guys. Uh, we have a paper that's out there with uh, a lot of data. Uh, there's a poster, so I'm going to present data today also, of course, but I'm mostly going to talk a little bit about what is this concept, because it's a relatively new concept that I will say something about today. Um, someone told me that this is the first uh, uh, research presentation at the MIT conference on soccer. So I figured it could be smart to do a little introduction to soccer and why the impact all over the world is so huge. So I borrowed this slide from some German colleagues of mine. What you see here is the development of heart attacks and stroke as a function of the summer months of three different years, 2003, 2005, and 2006. So the question, of course, is what happened in 2006? And I'll give you a little hint, although I think some of you may be onto it already. Uh, the heart attacks that you see here happened in the Munich area in Germany. And the key to the diagram comes here. So basically, every time Germany played a game in the World Cup, people dropped like flies. <laughs> and I wish that this was something that only happened in Germany, but in fact, the same results have been uh, covered, uncovered in uh, the Netherlands, uh, in Switzerland, in England. So this is a global phenomenon. The researchers argue that simply just watching an important game for your team in the World Cup uh, triggers stress levels that are equivalent to experiencing natural disasters. So this is pretty serious things we're talking about. I'd like to focus on one particular game, the one when Germany played against Italy. This was the semi-final of that tournament. Germany lost. Uh, Italy won and went on to win the whole World Cup. Uh, we're going to go into that game and just see a little snippet from the last part of the second extra time. Uh, Italy has a corner kick. Andrea Pirlo is waiting outside the penalty box. He's going to get the ball. And he's going to show what I would say would be brilliant displays of vision. And I'd like you to enjoy that little piece. Pirlo. Krijgt de bal niet snel genoeg onder controle. Dit is wel goed. En daar is de goal van Italië. Gemaakt. Pirlo bewaart het overzicht en houdt het hoofd koel. Cool. Gaat niet rammen. Maar bedient Grosso met een prachtig balletje. En wat maakt hij het mooi af, zeg. So the pass opens up the defense and, the, and basically decides that game. Now what you see here, of course, is, is in the action a perfect look away pass as he hits the pass. But what I'm interested in here is what he did before that because his vision obviously happened before he looked away. And those seconds is basically a part of what I'm going to focus on today. What exactly happens those seconds, and why are they so decisive in this particular game? So in a way, we're going to talk about what Arsene Wenger refers to when he gave a talk a couple of years ago, when he says there are some special players who always find openings. Those who see will get you wins, but not many players are able to see like this. These are the players that I hopefully will shed some light on today. Now, there has been done a lot of research on this topic before. Um, and you see a typical setup from this research in the picture here, uh, where they put participants into a lab, they put a film in front of them, and, and, they, and they study their vision. Almost, or I think all studies, on visual search in team ball sports and also in soccer have been, carrying out, been carried out in these restricted lab settings. Where they've used film stimuli, they've looked at the eye movements, but eye movements only, not the whole visual system. And they've looked at non-relevant movements to these actions. So basically, moving a joystick or stepping to the left or right, like you can see on the picture here. In my opinion, there is an urgent need for more ecologically valid paradigms and studies of real-world situations. And that's kind of the paradigm that I'm trying to introduce here today. A little bit of my sort of conceptual foundation or theoretical foundation for this study today 
uh, and I'd like to take it all the way back to the evolution of visual system. So here you see a typical predator, a fox. Uh, look at the fox's eyes. The eyes are positioned at the front of the head. Oops. At the front of the head, which is functional for the fox, because the fox needs to be fully focused on what happens in front of him. The fox hunts for prey and needs to have super sharp vision of what's going on in front. And notice the difference to the typical prey for the fox, the rabbit. The eyes of the rabbit are positioned at the side of the head, which again is functional, because the rabbit needs to look out for the fox. Otherwise, uh, the rabbit will be in trouble. So the rabbit, with this positioning of the eyes, have almost a 360 degrees vision, field of vision, uh, which is very functional for the rabbit. What about humans? Humans definitely have frontally positioned eyes. And we can see that with player Frank Lampert here uh, showing uh, brilliant displays of focus, which is necessary for hu us as humans, but also particularly in sports like this, because you need to focus on what's going on around you. But what about then players such as Frank Lampert, when they're put in positions on the field, when things are happening around you, and it does happen around you for a midfield player in soccer? What he needs to do then is compensate for the position of his eyes. And I'll show you exactly how he compensates in this video clip here. We're going in um, 10 seconds before he gets the ball. And look at how he compensates by basically looking around, scanning, exploring his surroundings before he gets the ball. quite active. There's a lot of work being done before he gets the ball. And this is what I've studied. Uh, and we've operationalized this as a visual exploration defined as a body and or head movement in which the player's face is actively and temporarily directed away from the ball with the intention of looking for information that's relevant to perform a subsequent action with the ball. So the purpose of our study was essentially to learn about the ways that expert professional soccer players use this visual exploratory behaviors in real world games, and specifically to examine the link between these behaviors and performance at the very highest level that we could find. How did we go about doing this? We got access to Sky Sports split screen player cam broadcasts. Uh, in total, 64 English Premier League games involving 118 players and a total of 1,279 relevant situations. Now, relevant situations here are situations where the players receive a ball in situations where they have relevant information behind their backs. I can get back to the definition if some of them are interested in that a bit later on. So the footage looks basically like this. And I'll show you here exactly how this plays out, again, using Frank Lampard. Look at how there's a little a snippet of film with the actual game events to the left, and then the big picture shows a close-up image of, of him. And again, you can detect his visual explorations before he gets the ball. So again, quite active. And what we see when we go into the data is first that there is a clear relationship between the level of these players and how much they engage in this activity. And the way we measured this here was basically to look at players who have received some type of individual award, such as FIFA World Player of the Year, uh, UEFA Club Footballer of the Year, Best Player in the Champions League, uh, Best Player in the World Cup, so, so highly prestigious awards. Those players in our whole sample, uh, they scored, like you can see, significantly higher on visual exploration. They had a higher mean visual exploratory frequency than the others. These were the top two explorers, Frank Lampert and Steven Gerrard. And as you can see on their numbers here, they had both above 0.6 explorations per second. Simply counted it and divided it uh, on the number of seconds. 
How about performance in the game? What we looked at here was, again, the relationship between exploratory activity and pass, comp pass completion. With the whole sample, uh, when we split the total number of visual explorations in three equal uh, uh, groups, we found that uh, the players or the situations where players ex uh, uh, explored the least with the low frequency, they hit about 64% of their passes. Whereas in the situations where they had the highest frequency, they hit significantly more, 81% of the passes. So this is the basic finding that we have, the most important foundational finding. Now there are uh, a lot of situations in this game that we need to account for to, to shed a little bit more light on this. And one is, you can see it here when I start this video with Paul's goals, uh, where he's also exploring a lot, he was also one of the high explorers, uh, is that you can play a pass that's completed, but it's not necessarily a very creative pass, it's not a pass that really, really does a lot of difference. So it's quite easy to play some types of passes, and we'll see an example of, of that here. The angle of this video is a little bit off, but I hope you get, uh, it looks like he played the pass forward, but he actually played the pass backwards. Uh, so we need to account for that. So because of that, we looked at also passes completed when only looking at the forward passes. And I also here looked at uh, midfielders only, so restricted it to basically half the sample. And this is maybe the most powerful finding that we have, this particular slide. So again, you see that there is, a close relationship, significant relationship between how much they explore and how they perform. Uh, and I think this is fascinating, because you see that the highest exploring group, the highest exploring third here, they hit nearly twice as many forward passes as players when they are exploring the least. But again, there may be uh, situations here that explain this, and I'll show you another one here because uh, there's big differences in the field with respect to where you are in the field and what type of pressure you ha have on. And what we find, for example, although I don't show the data here now, is that uh, when they have uh, a tight pressure on them, when there are a lot of players around them, they tend to explore less than when they have little pressure on them. And I'll show you here an example of a situation where Steven Gerrard has little pressure uh, and he explores a lot. So he's quite active and has all the space and time that he wants to hit uh, a decent forward pass. Actually, a really good forward pass. <laughs> so what we also did was to try to control for that. And one way we did that was to look at, OK, so are there differences in this pattern when we look at uh, actions on your own half and actions on the opposition's half? So these results are from the opposition's half. And again, you see the same pattern, only when we restrict it like this, you see that uh, the statistical values we get or the, the p-values we get, uh, they're not as favorable, uh, which obviously is because here the sample size gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So I would like more data to know for sure about these things, although the relationship is still significant. Now exactly what happens when they are in these tight situations, that's what we've started to look at now, which I think is, is fascinating. And the, and the way that I do this, is that I, I basically send people around Europe to film the players that I'd like to look at. Uh, so they buy a ticket to the stadium, they go into the game, they have a little camera with them, I have the same camera here and I'm trying to film some of the sessions here myself, uh, and they film players. So one of the, my students, he filmed here uh, Xavi in, in Barcelona, and you'll see here that here there's a lot of pressure on him. A lot of players around, but still he's able to explore, he's able to be incredibly independent of looking at the ball, before he receives the ball. Although it goes so quickly that I have to show you a slow motion of this clip so that you can actually see how much she explores in this particular situation. So that's one of his primary skills, he's very independent of the ball. Um, and you can also see this in, in, in the tight situations that are right in front of the goal. Uh, and here's a clip where I'd like to focus on Robin van Persie, the forward uh, of Manchester United. 
Now, now we're getting into real details. So these are details that coaches and players care about. Um, you'll see this clip now three times. And notice first how Van Persie is immediately engaging in visual exploration before he gets the ball once. But the question here is when does he do that? The timing of his visual exploration. And look at that timing in relation to the passer, which is Patrick Evra, who crosses the ball in, in, front, of the, in front of the goal. Well back, cleverly, grande azione United, Evra può mettere in mezzo, forte deciso Van Persi, lo United è in vantaggio. Here is the expiration, and you notice that it does that in that split second as the crosser hits the ball for the first time, right there, and it does that at that particular moment because when the crosser has hit the ball for the first time like that, Van Persie knows that for the next half second or so now, I don't have to look at the crosser because I know that now he's getting ready to cross the ball. So now I have 0.5 seconds where I can look at other things. And that gives him perhaps a little edge in front of the defender who doesn't think in that particular way. So what are the conclusions of this research? First of all, for these uh, English Premier League players, there is indeed a close relationship between exploratory behaviors and performance across roles and across locations in the field. And my thinking around this is that when players' eyes are not naturally exposed to relevant information, which is the case when they have information going on behind their backs, these exploratory behaviors are absolutely necessary for you to be able to see anything. You can't see stuff going on behind your back if you don't look behind your back. People don't have eyes in the neck. That is also a scientific fact that I like to stress here once and for all. But this is definitely also not a sufficient explanation for vision, because these expert players, they probably also process information more effectively. And we have also research on this, showing that expert athletes have higher signal sensitivity, and they also have definitely better pattern recognition. However, I would argue that with increased exploratory behaviors, eyes will be gradually exposed to more information. When you get more information in, and this will improve ability to effectively process this information. The more information you get through your eyes, the basically the, the more the, the visual system gets to practice. And then probably uh, signal sensitivity and pattern recognition will also come as a consequence of that. So uh, uh, exploratory behavior is, is important, I think. And this is one quick way towards the end now to show how this can be practiced. <laughs> This is the Avner Region player showing how you can take one very simple passing receiving exercise and make it a bit more functional by also practicing at least the, the coordination of the visual system with the receiving behavior, which is one little step towards making this uh, better. Now, to what extent can exploratory behavior be developed and or trained? Like, what are the principles involved in this? Um, I would argue that at the very bottom you have evolution, like I spoke about in the beginning. So that basically is the way that, that this system is hardwired into, uh, in, into animals, into people. At the other end of the spectrum, you have athletes' deliberate practice, like you just saw. And then there's one middle point here that I like to stress, and that is that, and we all know this, everyday behaviors, like crossing the street, uh, kids learn this at a very early age. They can learn this at the age of three, four, maybe, that if you cross the street, you better look left and right before you do that. Now, of course, the problem with both kids trying to cross the street and definitely also with uh, soccer players at an expert level is that once a ball is rolled out in front of them, they become ball watchers, I'm afraid, with different types of, of consequences. So the very last thing I'll, 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 I'll do uh, is to show just how this type particular behavior actually really decides the most important games in the world. So this is now the World Cup final. Uh, you can see here that we're five minutes before the end of second extra time, World, final, World Cup final 2010. And I'd like you to look at now this particular player. So this is Iniesta. In 10 seconds, he will score the winning goal for Spain. Uh, but before that, he's actually involved in the play one more time. He gets the ball and he plays the ball forward with a, with a heel pass. 
And what uh, uh, was, 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 was coming before that heel pass was his visual explorations. And you can see his explorations because Iniesta, he has the, he's using the same hairdresser as, as me. So every time he, he points his head around, you can actually see the screen kind of lighting up a little bit. Harley Dri på Navas. Men Elia hänger ju gott på. Får in en tackling, får sinka den kontringen led. Torres. Ser Iniesta där inne. Här är Fabregas. Ingen offside! Åh, oh, så skårar Andres Iniesta! Han blir historisk! Han skårar Spaniens första mål i en VM-finale! Okej. We had to start a couple of minutes late today because of technology, but uh, I believe we do have time for a couple of questions. And if you could line up in the middle here uh, to ask those questions, that would be logistically good. Hi, that was really uh, fascinating. I, uh, as somebody who, uh, who studies neural markers of expertise, uh, this is really interesting because, you know, it kind of resonates a little bit with like, um, kind of expertise of people who play chess, you know, that they have to see the board, right? Mm. And it sounds like the players in this case are almost like chunking the information of where their teammates and, you know, the opposition is. What I'm wondering is about, like, uh, ways of testing this in, like you said, ecologically relevant scenarios. I mean, here we're, at this conference, we're presenting in the baseball context where you have a set starting position all the time. Do you have any ideas for ways to do this in the soccer domain that you, you think might uh, transfer to that uh, you know, domain where you're moving around a lot and uh, you don't necessarily have a set starting position? Uh, great question. I mean, that's what we want. Right. Now we've seen some uh, practical demonstrations of how this actually goes on in the field and how can we control this to some extent and actually do experiments so that we find out a little bit more exactly how that works. Uh, it's hard. Um, uh, I've, uh, I've seen attempts at it, but they've not been able to do it because of uh, the, all the dynamic displays we're talking about there. You can't use one film screen because that kind of excludes everything that goes on around you. Now, one uh, thought that I do have, there are some clubs in Europe now who, uh, who develop pretty um, sophisticated training tools uh, where they set up almost like a lab, but it's for, for training. B uh, Borussia Dortmund, the, the German club, they have something that I think they call it soccer matic, which is basically a, a cage uh, where the ball is being fed to players who are standing in the middle of this cage from, I think it is 16 different positions. And it's being hinted at where they get the ball with light. And then they have to put the ball to another position that's being indicated with lights. Uh, now that machine costs, I think, half uh, a million dollars. Um, so it's quite expensive, um, but using something like that, I'm sure, could, could give interesting results. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more, so. I noticed that um, with, with your data, you were, t you were looking at a one-to-one -one pass, so if Ines is coming up, just, um, you know, he looks around, and then he finds that one player and scores a goal. So I was wondering is if, um, you've taken this further to the, like almost like let's say the hockey assist is known, you know, where he sees the play kind of like the chessboard, like two or three moves ahead, where he passes it to one, which then changes the shape of the field and allows him to find that secondary or tertiary player. Whether your data has shown any light on that, um, I mean, fascinating further views on how to take this a bit bit further. Uh, we have not gone into. Uh, those, I would say, extra layers of complexity with respect to the whole, the whole, the whole game. Uh, for, for now, we've started by, by trying to keep it relatively simple and see if we can find some of the, some of the key drivers. Uh, but the next steps definitely will be to try to uh, uh, get it in with the, with the rest of the uh, complexity of this game. Yeah. Uh, let's give Mr. Jornet a round of applause. Thank you.